Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, midweek supplemental. This is edition number 183, and it's inauguration day. Hopefully, we've all taken our chill pills. Hmm. Uh, coming up on the podcast, we're going to take a look at a couple of new knives coming out from Kai USA. Those are the that is the umbrella company for ZT and Kershaw. Uh, we'll take a look at a knife I dug out of my personal possessions that I totally forgot I had, and then we're going to talk about hawkbills and karambits today. We've been sort of cataloging different blade shapes recently. Uh, and illustrating them through my collection, but also just discussing the purpose, the utility, uh, the why of the blade shape. So today that will be karambits and hawkbills. Uh, so uh, I know we're all really excited about that, but before we get to that, I want to do a little, it's, it's sort of the initial show off period. It's called the pocket check. I just wanna show you what I'm carrying today. Now today, I'm gonna put this under the knife cam. Uh, today I am carrying the Zero Tolerance 0450 CF. It's a Sinkovich uh, design. And uh, oh, I said divine, but you know what? That works too because I love this design. Um, this style of sort of um, uh, slinky Sinkovich design really, really gets me. He's got a whole chunky style uh, that is also interesting that doesn't interest me as much, but I love these long uh, sort of. Uh, Slender, so one of them is sort of serpentine, the 460 style blades. Uh, they really turn me on. And then the four and a uh, four and a quarter inch blade length is just right. And uh, so this is the one remaining fully carbon fiber slabbed knife in my, no, 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 I take it back. I have a, a 20 CV Yojimbo also with carbon fiber, but I'm just not a huge fan of the material, except for the real exotic and expensive kind. And I just, I don't love it that much that I've sought it out. Uh, I have a couple of knives with inlays and such, but uh, this one remains uh, in, in, uh, in the rotation and uh, fully that sort of monotonous carbon fiber. And it does make the knife light and it is the original intention of this design, though I might have uh, Thomas, uh, Tom over at Blades and such make me a, uh, a nice micarta handle for this handle scale so I could swap it out. So today I'm carrying that and I'm also around the house today and I have, a, I have some stuff I've been putting off and that will require a work knife. So in my other pocket, I am carrying the uh, Cold Steel Folding Kiridashi. This little, what is this? blade. Uh, it's a two and a half inch blade. Um, as you can see, it's very angular. It's got that st very straight edge with an angle that comes off the handle um, kind of in an upward uh, motion, sort of like the uh, uh, USA made blades uh, half track that they make with the Warncliffe. That kind of looks odd when you look at it because the edge uh, edge is kind of sweeping, even though it's straight, sweeping away from the handle. Uh, but it turns out in draw cutting and the kind of cutting you would do with this sort of uh, utility shaped blade, um, that angle is actually quite valuable. You'll see it on traditional um, traditional kiridashis, which are uh, originally Japanese utility knives. You'll see that sort of angle. If you put it on the board there and line up, line up the handles, you see how on the Sinkovich it goes straight across the point is centered to the handle. Uh, but when you when you do the same thing here and put the edge along a straight line, you'll see how this is, well, it's angled for draw cutting and utility. So that's what I'm carrying today. That's what I'm gonna be using around the house. I got some boxes to cut down. I got some packages to open up. This thing is great for clamshells. This this sort of, uh, uh, you, um, not you, Jimbo, this sort of worn cliff shape. So uh, this was a 2020 release. And uh, Cold Steel brought back uh, in 2019, and they continued it in 2020, they brought back this sort of uh, integral grivery clip that were seen on the earlier Cold Steel knives, uh, the Voyagers and such, um, except on those, you couldn't even remove it. This, you can remove it. Uh, to what end? I'm not sure. I guess so you can just pop it in your pocket without a clip, um, but you can't switch it to the other side or anything like that. 
So uh, a great release. Um, speaking of Cold Steel, uh, people have been sort of, uh, people, myself included, have been kind of going on and on about uh, what's the fate of Cold Steel going to be that GSM has bought them. Well, it seems that uh, they had some really Cold Steel-ish knives in the, uh, in the chamber waiting for 2021. They have uh, uh, Jimmy Slash has a video out uh, with a with a catalog. I'm not sure how he got his hands on it, uh, but you can see because I, I haven't been able to find it uh, as of today anyway. And you can see the things that are coming up, and they're they're resuscitating, re resurrecting uh, the Holdout series. They're resurrecting the uh, uh, the um, Talwar, the large anyway. I didn't see the four inch in there, and then they're also coming out with a four inch Chris Tylight, and uh, you know some 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 uh, swords and daggers and stuff and some axes. So they're, they're still up to their old tricks. Uh, hopefully that continues, uh, you know, indefinitely into the future. So uh, at least for now, we can all stop clutching our pearls about 2021 uh, Cold Steel. And I, you know, group myself at the, at the, at the head of that line. So uh, coming up tomorrow night on Thursday Night Knives, it being the third Thursday of uh, the month, in this case, January, uh, we're going to be doing our Patreon Gentleman Junkie giveaway for the $10 uh, level. And I just want to show off what it is really quickly. It is the Off Grid Knives Sea Dog version two, and it's all blacked out. This is a D2 blade, uh, three and a half inch D2 blade. All right, three and a half inches. Yep. Uh, it's got G10 handle scales here. It's got it's fully steel lined. It's not pocketed out in there. So this thing is substantial. This is a real work workhorse kind of knife. Uh, it's, it's flat ground. You've got this uh, upswept, what are we gonna call that? Pirate blade? I don't know. It's sort of like a, a, a curvy Warncliffe, cleavery kind of <laughs> boarding sword kind of thing. Uh, it's got jimping on the back. It's flat ground, very sharp, great action on bearings. It's got... Uh, a wonderful glass breaker. I say wonderful, I haven't used it yet, but this is the type I like with a little tungsten carbide ball bearing in there, uh, you know, mounted in a little sort of cone there. Uh, it's got a deep carry pocket clip with recessed screws. Thank you very much, carry, carry of off grid knives. There is this uh, on this side on the, hmm, what do you call that? I guess on the lock side of this liner lock, there is a very small and unobtrusive secondary lock that you can push forward so that if you're really working hard with this thing and gripping it tight, you're not uh, accidentally disengaging the lock. They give you a pretty generous uh, scoop out on the, uh, on the show side handle to access that lock. So this uh, additional lock on the, uh, on the lock side, saying lock a lot, is, uh, is welcome because if you don't wanna use it, you barely notice it's there, but if you want it, it's there. So there you go. You can switch the clip. This will be the giveaway knife next week. I have one of these and I highly recommend you, you have one too. Uh, the Off Grid Knives Sea Dog version two, very generously donated to the uh, to the podcast by our good friend Dave over there at this old sword blade reviews on YouTube. He has an awesome collection and uh, you should definitely check him out. He's got a history in, in Kali martial arts. So he knows knives from a, from a, a very interesting perspective and he's got an eye for design so check out his channel for sure thank you dave uh also i want you to ch check out some of the videos i've been putting out on youtube uh i am proud of them i'm happy i'm doing them i've, I've been kind of recording five at a time or so and then dripping them out over the week and because i have a lot of knives here and i, I want to uh I want to show them off under the bright light under the knife cam so that <clears throat> people can get a closer look at them. So definitely check me out on YouTube, the other videos and such, if you're just listening here and, uh, and well, get a view of, of what we're doing over here. Um, still to come on uh, episode 183 of the podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about what happened to Manly Knives USA, their sort of new incarnation. We're going to talk about uh, some things downstream like uh, Karambit's Hawkbill Blades and also a knife I dug out of my personal possessions. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. So the first thing I wanted to talk about on Life Knife uh, on Knife Life News today uh, is the passing of Jim Frost. Uh, this happened on January 7th. And uh, well, if you were alive on January 7th, you know there was a lot of other stuff going on. And uh, this sort of news, uh, this news was, well, it was overshaded. Uh, and I, I sort of uh, 
missed out on talking about it last week. But uh, Jim Frost is a legend of the industry. He uh, started Frost Cutlery in the in the early '70s, and and uh, he uh, created a whole bunch of brands under the Frost Cutlery uh, sort of umbrella. And uh, I have uh, I, I've had a few Frosts along the way. My first folding knife with a clip and uh, with one hand one handed action and serrations was a frost cutlery knife and I gave it to my cousin and I don't know what whatever became of it and now I wish I had it but uh, uh, Jim Frost will be remembered uh, for brands such as Buck Creek, Coon Hunter, Frost Family, Bull, uh, German Bull Brand, Hen and Rooster which is a which I used to have one lost one of those but a great knife and and others Steel Warrior and Tac Extreme we can all uh, guess what Tac Extreme kind of knives are. Um, so uh, a, a great uh, man to have been in the industry, and, and we all uh, we all owe him a debt of gratitude for the for the ground he's broken. And uh, the gentleman died due to complications of COVID nineteen, which is uh, well sad to hear. So Jim Frost, rest in peace, sir. Uh, next, I want to talk about Manly USA. Do you remember Manly USA? They were around for. Mm, a mm, couple of years there, a couple of years back, a Bulgarian knife company, and they came on the scene with a um, slip joint knife called the Wasp, I believe it was. And uh, people were going nuts about it because it was beautifully thinly ground, fully flat ground, kind of outperforming uh, the, the premium slicey knives of the time, like uh, the, the Spyderco Paramilitary 2 and and I think the three was just coming on the scene and, and other knives that people were talking about as being nice and thin. Um, Manly was coming out and just uh, sort of stealing the show there. And then, uh, as we announced on this show about a year back, they closed their doors and, and they said, we'll be back. We're just reforming. And they've come back as Maker Blades. And Maker Blades seeks to, uh, under under their bladesmith, uh, Teofil Simon. Uh, that's... Simo, Simov, Simov. Uh, so he's gathered together some Bulgarian knife makers and they are putting out these handmade knives. They have five models right now. Two of them are inspired by a, a, a knife maker and knife sort of uh, legend that I love, uh, Fred Perrin, French uh, knife fighter slash knife designer. There are two knives here uh, based on his work. Uh, but they're all handmade and uh, they all, each one is unique, like a fingerprint. And um, th if you can, you can see the prices there, they're, they're remarkably reasonably priced. So it's, it's kind of an interesting, um, interesting venture here. It's, uh, I, I, and I'm unsure why uh, it seemed like they were uh, kind of going gangbusters with their little slip joints and folders they seemed to me to be sort of like a, a trm competition or uh you know a small label spider co competitions that kind of thing it, it's surprising to me that they went off into on this angle uh but you know you never know what someone's personal mission is and also maybe they f figured it was a crowded pond a small and crowded pond so let's try something else but in any case, I'm I'm I think it's a very interesting move. You know me, I love fixed blades. I love Fred Perrin. So those two, the one called Perrin, and then the other is called a recurve Perrin. Uh, those are the big feature blades that they're showing. Look amazing, and you can tell that they're made from different kinds of Damascus canister of that kind of thing um, because of the different patterns you can see. So uh, interesting news. Uh, we'll see what happens. Hopefully, they see as much success as Maker Blades as they did during that short uh, Manly USA period. And, and I'm assuming it's a su success. Obviously, if they were making tons of money or if it was a great uh, business thing, they wouldn't have changed it. So, you know, who knows? What do I know? But interesting, I can't wait to see what happens with them. Uh, another company I can't wait to see what happens to is Kai USA. I don't mean happens to. Kai USA isn't going anywhere. They have Kershaw and they're they just consistently year after year just come out with more and more um, nice looking models, high performing models for the money. Um, knife models for non knife people is is basically what I'm getting at. Most Kershaw knives, um, you know, across the spectrum are, are not marketed to you and me. 
Uh, they're marketed more to people who need knives and who are in the, in the aisles at the time and they see it and it's a cool looking knife and it's the right price and they buy it and they use it until they buy another one because that one is crapped out on them. But every year they do release a number of knives that are a little bit more for us. Um, uh, that's why they still hold on to the, um, you know, everyone wants to know why assisted, why assisted? Well, you know, it's the assisted knives that make them the most money um, because most non-knife people think it's cool and it's a convenience. Um, but, you know, you and I have gotten tired of the assisted knives on the whole. So for us, they come out with uh, things like the Strata. We'll get to that in a second, but I want to talk about ZT. Now, ZT, uh, they're, they're up zero tolerance. They're high-end brand. I don't know. Last couple of years, it's been, uh, feels like it's lost its compass a little bit. Um, uh, they, they come out with a lot of retreads of older designs. They'll change the steels, change the handle materials and that kind of thing. And, and that's appreciated because there are some models like the, the 562, the Hinderer design slicer that uh, have been around for a long time and are extremely popular and people keep wanting them. So they'll, they keep releasing different versions of it. That's cool. Um, you know, we all, we all like when knife companies are, are, um, thinking about collectors, uh, but there hasn't been too much in the way of new stuff. Last year, they came out with the 308. Uh, they're, they're, they're on this thing right now with their in-house designs uh, or, or with their, you know, where they're naming knives after calibers. They had the 556. That was actually an, uh, an outside knife maker uh, designed that, but we love them for their old school beefiness. To me, they they really peaked with the Emerson designs. Um, I love the Sinkovich designs. I love all the others. But recently I've been, I don't know, I, I thought the 308 looked good. Anyway, what I'm getting at is this year they've come out with two new ones uh, so far and, and a retread. Uh, the retread is the 308. Now it's in black with the tiger stripes. That's cool. Everyone likes tiger stripes. Everyone likes black. Uh but it's a retread. So what are the two new, new the two new knives? The 0762, that's an in-house design. And um, I love, hate it. I love it from the, from the tip to the pivot, tip of the blade to the pivot, from the pivot to the, to the pommel. Ugh. I, I just, ugh. it's, you know, they, 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 they're sitting on a huge store of that carbon fiber, presumably. And uh, that color blue just is so 2013. And uh, I'm just kidding about that, by the way. And uh, I just don't like the holes in the in the handle. I don't like the sharp, pointy pommel. Uh, it, it seems to be going for practical with the blade, and then it gets to the handle, and it's all kind of fantasy. And I think it's a bit of a misstep design-wise. Uh, um, also, I think it's 3.25 inches in terms of blade length, but I don't mean to be talking out of school if I'm wrong which to me is, uh, again, it's just, it's tepid. Like this design is tepid. It's going for um, like cool and unique, uh, but it's missing the mark. Now where I think it is cool and unique is in that blade. Uh, that blade is, is at once highly utilitarian and looks so, and at the same time, highly menacing and, and could function great as a self-defense knife. It also is quite reminiscent of the 0550, the, um, the or 0055, uh, the Sacchini model. So it has that same similar vibe with the with the angular blade. I love that. Uh, I saw that Metal Complex has a video on the on this up, and I got to check that out because uh, maybe that'll change my opinion of it once I see it moving in someone's hand. And and um, but the holes, ugh, the holes. It's it's an ugly handle. Does anyone else agree? It's an ugly handle. And the blue, I'm tired of the blue. There are other colors or, you know, well, whatever. That's that's a taste issue. So the 0762, at least it's a, at least it's a new design. Um, and I appreciate that. But zero tolerance, come on. Come on, zero, or come on, Kai USA. Spend a little bit of energy on zero tolerance. And let's get another year where we have four or five really solid unique new entries. There are so many great knife makers out there that whose, whose work could deserve or would, would, would merit the ZT treatment, the ZT touch. I'm just thinking right now about a Matthew Christensen ZT would be so cool. You know, I mean, his designs would fit right in, but who knows? I, I don't know. I don't know in the company. I don't know what their, 
what they're dealing with. So anyway, the next one is another in-house design. It's the 0990, and it's in the their 900 line of weird looking knives. Um, unique, definitely. And uh, you know I like that. Uh, if you if you're the sort of collector as I was, and I've moved away from this, who feels like your collection is a a, um, a, a microcosm of, of the knife universe at the time, and you have to have samples of super unique designs and, and engineering and stuff, this would be a great one. Uh, again, we have, we have a knife with a blade that uh, is very attractive to me. To me, this looks like the, um, the one they came out with last year, can't remember the name, uh, just with a hole cut into it for the blade, but that handle, you know, that's the, that's the interesting part, that back strap uh, with the stop pin. And um, that looks like it could be pinchy uh, to me, but uh, who knows uh, if you use the flipper, I guess it wouldn't be. Uh, if you slow roll it out, you might need to watch where your, where your finger fat is. Uh, this one has a unique handle, but somehow it works to me. It looks better. And maybe it's because it doesn't have those, uh, distracting uh, lightening holes. I like the uh, I like the the treatment of the carbon fiber on this as as sort of inlay or the titanium itself as inlay. This is technically a uh, inset liner lock. Um, so this will be another one uh, interesting one to check out from afar. I have uh, no interest in getting this myself. Um, there it is with the uh, you see the clip and I can see right through that hole that those are domed screws domed screws on a deep carry pocket clip people have we not jim can you go back to the other uh version uh, the other side of it i want to see if it's pocketed for yeah okay so it has uh you can switch the clip to the other side but it, it doesn't sit in a pocket and and when it doesn't sit in a pocket that makes it even more essential that you have flat screws uh otherwise it's going to tear up your pocket, even though those screws are rounded over. Every time you push it past, uh, past the fabric and then pull it back out, it's going to it's going to cause wear. So that's a problem, uh, <laughs> a serious serious problem. So the zero nine nine zero, another in-house design, something very unique. I got to say, uh, both of these knives this year are extremely unique looking, and I do appreciate that. So I don't mean to just dump all over CT. It's just that uh, I, I've i always gone to them for a certain kind of thing. And um, that is the beefy, the chunky, the strong. This Sinkovich that I'm carrying today, even though it's slender in, in look, is has all of that beefy, strong, uh, feel. Uh, two years later, three years later, they came out with the 0460, also a Sinkovich, uh, thin, sinuous design. That had a totally different feel. I ended up getting rid of it. It was like, it felt like candy. It was light. Uh, so uh, Kershaw this year, I'm just going to talk about one of the new knives coming out. Uh, talked about this on Thursday Night Knives. I, I think it's very cool. And I also think it's a strategic move on the part of, uh, of Kershaw to... Um, Put something out there uh, that's parallel to, in some ways, Cold Steel, because obviously they knew Cold Steel sold to GSM probably long before any of us did. And, uh, and, and I believe they prepped this particular line of knives for, for that. And it's called the Strata, the Kirch, uh, Kershaw Strata line. Now, this is a, a Kershaw line. I will be, I will be buying this. It's based on Spanish Navaja, you know, uh, one of my absolute favorite uh, blade styles, um, which is also what the Cold Steel Espada series is based on. And uh, so this is, I'm seeing this as a direct competitor with this knife. This is the Cold Steel Espada large five and a half inch blade. Now, if we look at the Kershaw, the large strata, it has a five and a half inch clip point blade on this uh, Navaja platform, that sort of a horn-shaped handle that tapers off towards the pommel. Um, excuse me. However, this Kershaw here is much more, you look at it, it's much more uh, stylized. It's sort of an art deco look, uh, whereas the cold steel really borrows heavily from the more traditional look of the traditional knife. The Kershaw coming in at five and a half inches, it, that's just totally unique for their line of knives. They don't have anything five and a half inches. And this is a, this is a bold... <laughs> a bold uh, uh, sojourn into un uncharted territory for them. Um, uh, they also have a 
four and a half version, a four and a half inch version of this, sorry, four and one quarter inch version of this coming out. So the small version is also huge, kind of in line with cold steel knives, how they have the two different, uh, they have two different lines. Uh, if you're looking uh, at the screen or not, it, you can see that this knife, uh, the Strata, both, both sizes, has two interesting uh, design features that I really dig. One is uh, a small flipper tab that uh, just barely pokes out of the spine when it's closed. And once it's deployed on bearings and opens up, it is uh, totally hidden behind the forward um, finger guard of the handle itself. So the, the flipper disappears. The other feature I really like is covering the pivot on the show side is a, hmm, what is that shape? Sort of elongated diamond shaped uh, stylized art deco kind of carved piece of brass, or maybe that's copper. And when you flip it over and look at the lock side where you can access the pivot uh, with your T whatever screw, probably T8, you'll see that it also doubles as a uh, lock bar, sta not stabilizer, but a lock bar over travel device. Can you go to the next uh, shot of that, Jim? And uh, yeah, you see, so that that tab is mimicked on the other side. It lacks the carving and the uh, and the uh, adornment there, uh, but you can see you can access and and change the pivot tension there or unscrew it there. But also, uh, the one side of that diamond shape covers up a corner of that lock bar, so you can't overextend it uh, if you're in a high high stress situation and you're closing your knife, um, you won't over travel because that cool little piece of brass is there. So uh, Kershaw Strata, I, I've seen a lot of their knives, but this, uh, a lot of the knives from 2021 and they're all, I mean, not, many of them are appealing, uh, but this is the only one that I was like, okay, I must have, and I'll probably get both the four and a half and, and the, or the four and a quarter and the five and a half inch blade. Um, a to give Kershaw some love. I mean, I, I I I give credit where credit is due, and they've. They, I mean, they've always made some great great knives, but I feel like uh, I just haven't had much interest in getting them recently. Uh, but this, oh yeah, I'll be getting that. Plus, um, I need a couple of larger knives that aren't cold steel, larger folding, uh, larger folding knives that aren't cold steel, just so I have something to, you know, is it impossible for anyone but them to do it? No, I don't think so. So let's uh, let's let's widen the the scope of things. So yeah, look for that here on this channel. So uh, I want you to call us and tell us what you're excited about knife-wise. What's coming out that you're excited about? Uh, what have you gotten that's new in 2021 uh, that we need to take a look at? What have, I, uh, what have I overlooked that's coming out for 2021, which is pretty much everything because I've barely taken a look yet. So uh, let us know what you're excited about, 724-466-4487. 724-466-4487. And uh, let us know what's on your mind with that. And uh, well, coming up, we're going to take a look at Hawkbill and Karambit blades. But before we get to that, uh, I want to I want to show you something cool that I came across uh, from deep in my past. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. Okay, so this weekend, uh, this past weekend, I was doing a little bit of cleaning up. Uh, had to, uh, had to. We're putting some lights in the ceiling, so that mean, meant going into the attic, and and uh, so I. Oh, what's this? We pulled out a box, and I found a knife that uh, that I got in a sporting goods store in Dublin, Ireland, in 1984. <laughs> it's a weird, weird thing. Uh, I, I was, uh, I was in. It was the summer before eighth grade, I guess. And uh, my sister was going uh, overseas to Ireland for a study abroad program. And my mom and I went with her to kind of help her get set up. And it was kind of a trip for me and my mom. We had a nice bonding time. We got to see a little bit of the uh, um, eastern coast of Ireland. And it was really, really mm, a great experience, great people. It was so beautiful and uh, just really, really fun trip. And... Uh, we went into a sporting goods store in Dublin, and of course, I went right to the knife section. I mean, I, I, I kind of forget that this has been in my blood all along. And uh, so I go right to the sporting goods section, and I'm like, Mom, you know, this is what I want. This is my souvenir from Ireland, a dive knife. And and I think uh, even at the time, this is probably the only kind of 
you know, knife like this that you could get just in stores. Uh, but <laughs> this is what I came home from Ireland with. This is my, my keepsake. It's called a Cressy sub. I'm not sure if that's a company that's still around. I need to do a little research on it. Uh, Enox. So that means, uh, that's the sort of European indicator for, um, stainless steel, right? It's got a serrated back edge and a really dull primary edge. And I think that might be de rigueur for, um, for dive knives. I don't think you want a razor sharp dive knife because you're using it to pry stuff and that kind of thing. Um, I'm pretty sure. Does this make me a knife junkie? I would say yes. Um, my mom is very cool and she's like, oh, all right, it's your money. If that's what you're going to remember this trip to Ireland by. Um, you know, she ended up getting me a sweater. I also got a shillelagh, uh, but, <laughs> but I don't know where those are. Of course, I've, you know, kept this all along. So um, it's kind of fun to go through your stuff, go through your old stuff, go through the old boxes. Uh, that you've just kind of been carrying around with you from place to place. I lived in so many apartments before we moved into this house over the years. And a lot of those boxes never got cracked open. They just went right into storage wherever I moved. And and uh, so it's kind of cool. So if you have an attic or a basement or a, a box in a closet that you haven't cracked open, it could be worth your time to do so. Even if you don't find any knives, it's cool to dig back into your past and to remember things through the objects you uncover. Um, and for me, it was this Cressy sub. Um, but this is gonna go, uh, this, is, this has gone back into the knife cabinet. It's been united with the rest of the collection. And uh, man, I let, as I mentioned earlier about, about my frost first uh, frost cutlery knife, my first uh, clipped one-handed opening serrated knife that I got in like 92 or three or something like that. I gave all those old knives to my cousin and uh, I don't know if they still exist. I got to ask him next time I talk to him. Uh, but anyway, I kind of wish I held onto those like I did this. Uh, that's all I have for state of the collection this week because uh, I've been a good boy, um, but I just, uh, I, I just broke that streak last night uh, and uh, bought a Yo Jumbo. I know what took me so long uh, from a guy on uh, Blade Forums. It's new in box. Can't wait to get it. I think I'm going to send it out and have some tweakage done to it, uh, to the handle, but, but we shall see. And if I do, you will come along for the ride and be a part of it. All right, coming up next, let's talk about karambits and hawkbill knives. Let me, let me get this whole mise en place set up. It's like a kitchen here with all these tools and, and ingredients. Okay, we're going to talk about hawkbill knives and karambits, but but as we do, I, I just want to illustrate the difference or, or I want to show last week we talked about recurves, which um, one of the main uh, benefits of a recurved is this accelerated slashing power that you get from the curve. Because if you look, we'll look at this uh, uh, Voyager uh, Vaquero here. If you look at the, at the uh, blade here, right here at the recurve, it gathers the material and forces it into this curve. And then as you continue your arcing slash, it, it sort of gives way here and turns into an upswept sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, like scimitar slash. So you get these two sort of uh, different kinds of cuts. In the hawkbill style, we will use this um, cold steel frenzy. The hawkbill is, is a bit subtle on this, but if you see as you continue to slash and your arm arcs as the material moves down the cutting edge of the blade towards the tip. It's gathered together. It's bunched together and forced into the tip and the tip splits and, uh, and digs. So you have two different kinds of cutting happening here. I mean, you get some of that on the recurve, but then you get a, a different sort of slash as it goes away, uh, as it recedes on the upward edge. But with the hawkbill, it just keeps digging in like a claw until it has uh, it is penetrated and splits and rips. And that's uh, you know whatever you're whatever you're cutting with this. And and these things happen to be uh, hawkbill knives are not just uh, and even I, I dare say karambits are not just for fighting. And I'm not just talking about cutting like 
enemies. Uh, these things all are derived from actual utility tools, especially the Karambit. Um, so we're going to talk about them, and uh, I'm going to show off kind of a, a different uh, a spectrum of the things uh, that you'll find in the Hawkbill. And starting with them is probably the most, uh, well, actually, before I get going, I want to show you this. This is the traditional Filipino weapons uh, gununting. And so you will see that this is a large Hawkbill blade with a gorgeous handle. Look at that handle. Really keeps it in your hand. Uh, but if you watch as I go across the straight lines here, it curves down and it's like uh, having a sickle on a handle. And that's the kind of effect you're getting with the, uh, with the Hawkbill blade. Uh, so the first one I'm gonna show is the most accessible without a doubt. And it's a simple carpet knife. This is a Milwaukee carpet knife. This is a folding version. They have a line of pretty kind of cool knives, actually. You can get at Home Depot and probably elsewhere uh, with this red handle. And they're liner locks. And to open them, you have to press the button and kind of whip it out. So it's, it's a little different from what we're used to. Uh, but this is, I mean, look at this. This is an extreme hawkbill. This is for cutting carpet. You want to hook it, you want to grab into the, the sharp edge right in this area, and you want to pull. That is the uh, that is the benefit of this knife here. This one lives in my car. It um, I forget it's there, frankly. I need to sort of resurface it a little bit and bring it back up to the top. Uh, but it, it, you know, I keep it there because if it got stolen, it wouldn't be the biggest deal in the world. Uh, it would be a very useful tool for a number of reasons. Um, and also it's, it's sort of excusable to me, or at least I would, I imagine it is because it's a, it's a thing that you can go buy at, uh, at Home Depot that a lot of people have just to work on carpet, cut carpet. So, uh, kind of an interesting and cool way to get yourself into a hawk bill, an extreme hawk bill blade without spending, you know, more than 15 bucks. So uh, now we're going to go into the Karambit style because this extreme hawkbill is what Karambits really are. This is the 599. This is the uh, Fox made um, Karambit knife. It is the smaller version than the 579. The story goes like this. Originally, this design was sent to Fox Knives, Italy, and there was a bit of a... Uh, problem with the translation and uh, millimeters and inches and all that got conflated and they came out with the 479 with a giant handle. Um, the handle is for the meatiest of paws for the broadest of, of palms. And uh, they were dissatisfied with it. The makers, the original uh, makers of this were dissatisfied with it and had this version made and uh, it is now exclusive. Oh, it was exclusive for a while uh, to karambit.com. Now I think you can buy it everywhere. Uh, but it is the same version uh, as uh, it is the same knife as the 579, except instead of aluminum handles, it has G10 lined with steel. And it is a smaller handle so that regular human hands can grip it without having a whole bunch of extra down by the pinky. Uh, this thing is a beautiful, I think it is a beautiful looking knife. I think, uh, you know, I very, very rarely carry it. Uh, but I think just for, for Karambit, I think it's just beautiful. I used its training knife. It comes with the training. It doesn't come with it. You have to buy it separately. Uh, but it's a high fidelity reproduction training knife. Used it a lot in my Kali classes and found that that flipper there is a real, real menace. Here, I'll show you what I mean. The flipper is actually vestigial. It's totally useless because it doesn't, and this is this is goes for the same with the live blade. It does not open the blade unless you really whip it with your wrist. So it's not really a good flipper. And then when it's open, it's it's not a good guard either. If you see, it 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 is not concurrent. The design of that, it looks like it's set up for a different handle. It it, you know, you see the scoop, the finger scoop 
in the G10 here, and then there's a step down, and then there's this jagged uh, um, flipper tab just sticking out there. And when you're when you're practicing with your with your partner with this thing, and it, there's so many times I grabbed uh, my partner's arm, flesh, or whatever with this, and gouged and just you know tore and caused blood. Now I just <laughs> never got around to taking it off. It's not really there for a purpose. You don't want to grind the whole thing off because it won't stop at the stop pin, but you can definitely get rid of everything that you see there and everything you see there. So this is an older version. Granted, I have not checked out to see if Fox is making this on bearings now. That is, you know, could be quite likely. I'm just not sure. Uh, but if you do get that 599 or the 577, you know, maybe on the on the on the live blade, you keep the menacing uh, gougy guard there. But for practice uh, purposes, I would I would just uh, take that off. And since I haven't practiced uh, karambit stuff with a partner in a long time, I just haven't gotten around to it. Uh, as you can see, as all folding karambits should have, this has the Emerson wave there. Because really, what is the point of having a karambit in your pocket? And then pulling it out and having to open it and then reverse it and put your finger in there. You may as well just, uh, you know, take the guy's gun and shoot yourself or, or take the guy's knife and stab yourself. It's so, yeah, folding karambits should have some quick way of opening. Speaking of Emerson karambits, this here is the Emerson Super Karambit. This is a knife that my brother gave me for my. Mm, 46th or 47th birthday, I believe. And uh, always, always wanted an Emerson Karambit. And he got me the super. And uh, man, that blade is is wicked looking. And you look at it. I remember when I first saw this, I'm like, why is it dull? Why doesn't it have a point? But really, that's point enough. First of all, you're doing a lot of uh, slashing with this knife and trapping and that kind of uh, tearing. But uh, even so, that is like having a sharp, it's like having a pointy Warncliffe because when this is in your, when this uh, Emerson Super Karambit is gripped in your hand like this, uh, traditional uh, way with your finger through the ring and you punch, you can, you can use that point uh, effectively. I mean, theoretically, of course, I've never actually done it on a person, but I've done it on stuff and it works like on cardboard boxes. That's the kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff we suburban warrior dads uh, fight with. Um, so yeah, Emerson Crabbit, thank you, Vito. Great gift. Uh, I love this thing. Um, this is a little big for my hands. I gotta say, you can look at the difference between the uh, the Fox, which fits perfectly, and the Emerson. There's a substantial difference there. Um, but maybe when I grow up, it'll fit my hand better. Okay. Uh, next, a Crabbit that I carry every day pretty much at work and that is the uh diagnostic by bastinelli knives now that this rides on the back of my work id here and you just pull it out and you got a little two finger karambit this thing no doubt would be great in a pinch if you needed to claw your way out of a sticky situation of course what wouldn't be, you know most most knives whether they're intended for that purpose or not would be uh but this one just you're doing it with panache and style, of course. Uh, this is gets mostly used for opening envelopes and boxes and is fantastic for the purpose. My wife has one uh, that she keeps gripped in her hand when she goes running, which makes me feel better, makes her feel better. And uh, so this is D2, it's chisel ground. And, uh, oh no, this is N690, I'm sorry. This is not D2. Made by Fox Italy, designed by Bastian Coves. Great, great little karambit. They, uh, this one also comes in one, I think it's called the Pical or Pika. Uh, that is a full, full grip, but I like that little one just to hang behind my, my work tag. That thing uh, replaced years and years of CRKT minimalist carry. Love that knife. Okay, so next, uh, uh, a karambit that is in my view every day, sometimes more than once a day. And it is my shower knife. It is the uh, Cold Steel FXG. That means, I'm not sure what FXG stands for, uh, but this is their plastic knife karambit. Please excuse the soap scum, frankly. Uh, I tried scrubbing it out with a brush. It's in there. 
Um, but it's clean. Let's just put it that way. It's very, very clean. Uh, no infections from getting cut with this sucker. What a great design of the handle here. So some, uh, for the handle here, sometimes people make karambits just by plopping a ring on the top of the handle. That's a different kind of knife. That's more like a ring dagger where you're, where you put your thumb through it and uh, the blade is canted sideways and it's just for, you know, uh, unrestrained thrusting. This is a different kind of thing with a karambit, the way you're traditionally gripping it, you have to have that uh, ring forward so that it's not pulling your hand back, pulling your fingers back. And I think uh, uh, with this, uh, and with the tiger claw, that, that what this is called? Yeah, they did a great job of designing that handle. And then this, uh, this little thumb swale with jimping is great, not only for your thumb there, also if you don't use the ring, it's great. I like gripping garambits without the ring. Oftentimes it's like having a nice big wide pommel. Uh, but also if you're manipulating it and flipping it around, which I can't do under the knife cam, uh, it's a great way to arrest the motion. This little thumb swale, stop it right there, flip it. Ah. See, I just stabbed myself. If this were a real karambit, I'd be stopping tape right now and bleeding because this point just went flying into, yeah. Never flip a, a karambit <laughs> with your wrist up. It's just stupid. All right, so thankfully I did that on, on this knife here. All right, let's, let's clear some of these away. Uh, before we exit the world of karambits and go into the world of other things, uh, I wanna show this one. This is designed by Joe Caswell, and uh, he it's it's based on his design. It's not based. It's taken directly from his design, the Morphing Karambit. This is the CRKT Provoke. Here, there's his maker's mark. Let's see. I'm sorry. Let's see. Joe Caswell, Caswell Knives. He is known for his engineering prowess and innovation uh, in knife making. And he once said he'd come onto the podcast and then I got crickets from him. So I got to get him back on. I'd love to find out about his process. I mean, this stuff is crazy. So look at this, this knife, this karambit is a folder, but it opens in this double arm, swinging double arm fashion. So you hold it like this and not for nothing. You could use that ring as a, as a nuck there, but you hold it like this and you just flip it down, uh, flip the blade out with your thumb. And what it does is as you push down on the back of the blade with your thumb, it makes the two arms that grip the blade swing out and down and lock in the open position. And it is incredibly comfortable to hold. You look at this and you see a bunch of moving parts and you're like, oh, that looks pinchy. That looks like uh, you're holding a machine, but it's very, very comfy in hand, the way they've chamfered all this, all these surfaces. The blade comes out at a great angle. Uh, this, is, this is not just a unique and interesting uh, design and mechanism. This is actually a really good karambit uh, for the karambity purposes. When you flip it over and look at the clip side, it's got this very unique spring-loaded clip. This whole P-shaped um, piece of metal is the clip. You just pinch it right there and the clip lifts up so you can slide it into your pocket. And it does ride all the way up here and sits very discreetly in the pocket. You see about that much, see about that much, a little, tiny little bit of the circle, and then the clip comes down. Innovative and interesting design. I think it's really cool. And then the fact that it's a hawkbill shaped blade and then it's presented at that angle to the handle, it's, it's a very, very good uh, karambit as well as interesting device. Okay, next, uh, Hawkbill. I'm going to show you two straight up Hawkbill blades and then and then two wild cards. Two wild cards coming up. Uh, this fantastic knife is definitely going to get the blades and such treatment. I want deep, deep purple linen micarta handles for this. This is the PSARC, the Emerson PSARC. PSARC stands for Police Search and Rescue Knife. They have Excuse me, uh, Emerson makes the regular Sark, which is a blunted tip for just survival and rescue. This is for police, so I guess they assume you might need to stab something too. 
so they make it a, a pointy version. They also have one that has a gut hook at the very tip uh, that you can use to cut things open, like uh, seat belts and that kind of thing. Uh, so the Peace Arc has, again, we're looking at a, a subtle hawkbill shaped blade, but it's the angle that the blade is presented uh, from the handle that really adds to the cutting power. And yes, that slashes. We've talked a lot about slashing with this kind of thing and how the material gets gathered and pushed and split with the tip, but also on a draw cut, you're just pulling straight across something. That tip, is it's doing the same thing. It's, it's digging ever deeper and until you get to the tip where it actually just bites and splits. I mean, it, this is a chisel ground knife, which means it's very thin and very, very, very sharp. Uh, this one, uh, once I was noodling around with and I dropped it and it landed like this in my calf, where this part went into my calf and the handle, which wasn't locked open, sagged down and it did this. And I luckily pulled it out in time, uh, but I got a big, nasty, bleedy, uh, bleeding wound there. And uh, so I know that this works just in case there was any doubt out there. Yeah, this works. I have a deep carry pocket clip on this. Uh, so yeah, Hawkbill blade. A lot of it has to do with the angle of the handle to the blade. Here, as we showed before, is the Frenzy. This is a great knife. If, if they're still, I think they're discontinuing this. If you can still find one of these, they come in uh, gray and white, or I'm sorry, gray and black, green and black, or blue and black G10, just like this. If you can find one, pick one up. They are outstanding. Five and a half inch blade. You've got that very, very useful um, hawkbill blade and a very thin and spelt package. It's light. This is a five and a half in inch knife that you can put in regular jeans and carry around. And it's like nothing. It's like carrying a much smaller knife. And you can have other things in your pocket the whole nine yards. The only thing is uh, you can't have real, uh, I don't know, uh, I guess sh uh, shallow skinny jean pockets or something like that, but just regular uh, regular Levi's, these will fit. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that is the uh, Hawkbill. And now I wanna show two sort of wildcard knives. This one is a bit of a Hawkbill. This is the um, Copus Designs Elvia. Uh, designed by uh, Ed Calderon. So you look at this, you, you got the same sort of thing, but it's the reverse in terms of the angle and it's the reverse in terms of the edge. This is meant to be held in reverse grip like this with the point down and the edge in. So you're getting a lot of that uh, same benefit of the hawkbill blade, but it's being presented in a different way. Instead of here. Instead of the karambit with its with its curve facing outward and having to do this sort of upward scoop and, and upward slice or outward slice to make the point work and to make the edge work, on this, you're coming down and in, down and in, down and in, more like a cat. So uh, a hawkbill karambit-esque sort of fruit knife uh, thing. Here, so a bit of a wild card in how it's deployed and how it's carried, and uh, but still taking advantage of that Kirby blade. And lastly, we have the S curve blades. S curve blades. I, I think they first came to the fore with um, the Spyderco civilian in in the early '90s. Uh, Spyderco was tasked with the um, with the job of creating a knife for the, I think it was the police of South Africa or a knife that could be sold in South Africa because there were a lot of attacks happening, civilian attacks um, on people. And so the, the idea was create a knife that someone without training could bring to bear and be absolutely devastating with um, just using gross, uh, gross motor motions. And uh, Sal Glesser, I believe, came up with the S-curve blade. That's the civilian. I used to have uh, I used to have a version of that uh, by Spyderco. Uh, got rid of that a long time ago, but I replaced it with this. This is the Cold Steel Black Talon, and this is their take on that same shape, that S curve. 
So here you have you have a, a hump, you have the 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 upswept sort of you have four it's four stages here the uh, a hump, the upswept uh, sort of scimitar area, you have the recurve area, and then you have that nasty tip, which is going to pull and and split as you as you pull through it. So this is really uh, very much. Uh, Jeez, you know, like a gross motor thing. You just put this in your hand and grip it and slash wildly and something's going to get caught and something's going to get cut with this thing. Uh, I really like it. Uh, I, it used to be my my winter jacket carry because I figured with that, uh, if I ever needed it, heaven forbid, those serrations and that blade shape could, could definitely um, cut through leather and all that kind of stuff that you might encounter in the winter. Why did I choose this over the Spyderco civilian? Couple reasons, uh, but the main one is that it's way more robust. So if you look at a civilian as the S curve approaches the tip, it's really, really thin there. And they even say, don't use this as a utility knife. This is strictly for going berserk on your attacker with, uh, because it was, it was, a uh, delicate enough or it's delicate enough at the tip that they don't want you to be uh, horsing it through cardboard boxes and, and have the tip break off and you know like well it wasn't supposed to break off in cardboard it was supposed to break off in something else so i just decided with the triad lock and with the more robust blade i would uh, i would trade in the matriarch that's what i had a matriarch that's a sort of the the budget version of the civilian got rid of that got this now uh i'm I really, you know, I look at the cold steel serrations, which I very much like, but I also love the spider co serrations. So maybe someday in the future, I venture back and get an, an S curve blade from spider co because of those awesome, awesome serrations. So this has been my take on karambits and hawkbill blades. I think they're incredibly practical. I know that they're very, um, they, they can be devastating and menacing if used as weapons. And as, as I, always mention I'm not a fighter, but I do view knives through that lens because that's how I always have uh, from a child. It's just where my fascination lies. So uh, yeah, Hawkbill Blade. If you're interested in just uh, seeing what it's all about, why not check out one of these, you know, ultra cheap Milwaukee's and just see if you like what it's, uh, what it's like. Now the blade steel is, is no great shakes and uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a non-knife guy's knife, uh, the way it's set up, but uh, why not give it a try and see if you like the hawk bill. So everybody, I want to remind you to join us tomorrow night for Thursday Night Knives live, 10 p.m. Eastern uh, Standard Time on YouTube right here. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have an hour and a half or so, hour and 20 minutes of, of knife talk and banter between the commenters. And oftentimes we have people come on the show and we just... We just go down that rabbit hole, uh, that knife rabbit hole, and, and see where it leads us. We have a lot of very interesting people come out on with interests that uh, vary from, from the highly, you know, high budget knives or low budget knives, whatever you want to call them, to high end custom knives. We, we, we kind of we cover the waterfront there. So definitely check us out tomorrow night on Thursday Night Knives. And if you want to get in on that uh, Gentleman Junkie giveaway, Go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon and take a look at uh, you know whether you want to join or not. And if you want to get in on the giveaway, join us at Gentleman Junkie. So for Jim, uh, working his magic behind the switcher, and uh, for me, Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'd like to say have a great week. Uh, keep your head, and uh, we'll talk at you on Sunday. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. 
Thanks for listening to the Ninth Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.